Praise God. Once again, it's good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. You know, actually, you are the temple of God. But this physical structure allows us the opportunity to gather together as the body. And once again, I am so grateful for what God is doing in my life. And like I remarked before, it's amazing how God will put things together. And it's always based around His Word. And the message that the Lord has given me this morning, I was amazed at some of the things that took place that wove right into what it is that God wants me to preach this morning. I have had this message on my heart for 14 years. <laughs> but God's timing is as important as His will. And it's this morning that the Lord has ordered me, if you will, to preach this message. And this is something that the Lord laid on my heart a long time ago when I came back to Him in 2004 on April the 12th. The Lord brought me back into His presence in my bathroom. God is no respecter of place, just like Pastor Rodney was talking about, somebody under a bridge, by a river. It doesn't matter where they're at. It matters the condition of their heart to receive what God has for them. And only the Lord knows when that heart is thoroughly uh, prepared to receive what God wants to give them. The title of my message this morning is called Born Again, let the struggle begin. I think there's a few people out there that can relate to the title of this message. And I personally understand it thoroughly. And again, I want to take my text out of the book of Romans in the seventh chapter. You know, we have a class called the Crosswise class that Pastor Rodney has been teaching. He went through it about three or four times when I taught the crosswise. Matter of fact, nine? <laughs> Man, all right. I know it was quite a, quite a few because I enjoy teaching that class because I love to see the expression on people's faces when this revelation comes into their heart. And, of course, the class is an eight-week class, and we're going to start it up again very soon. Those that have you gone through it, I'd highly recommend you go through it again because it will stir up your heart and your mind. And I'm going to tell you something. The Word of God is not something you can read and set down like a novel of uh, Gone with the Wind, if you will. Because Jesus Christ is the one that commands the wind. And, uh, but this crosswise class, as I was saying, I taught it. And it, again, it's on the seventh chapter of the book of Romans. And I have asked other pastors to explain to me a particular scripture in Romans, and none of them could adequately do it. As a matter of fact, when there's guest speakers in other churches, I will confront them with this question on that scripture and have them explain it to me, and none of them can explain it. The reason they can't, because they don't understand the revelation that Paul talked about that he received in the book of Galatians. He said, I didn't receive it of men, nor as I taught it of men, but I was given it by Jesus Christ. Paul is the one that taught the church the doctrine of the new covenant, if you will. And a matter of fact, the book of Romans all the way through speaks, and it is, the foundation of the church. And in the seventh chapter of Romans, some people try to say that Paul was not saved. Oh, yes, he was. As a matter of fact, you will find, as you study the word of God, that Paul left the ministry for a number of years and no one ever heard from him. Because when Paul was saved on the Damastic or Damascus Road and he was blinded and then he was sent and had his sight returned and he received the baptism with the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is for servitude, there's very little that you can do in the kingdom of God because it takes the power of the third person of the triune Godhead to be able to do anything in the kingdom of God 
First of all, you confront a power that is far beyond anything that you can imagine in and of yourself. And when Paul received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, after he was converted on the road to Damascus, then he went out and he began to preach Christ. The Lord stopped him. He had an incomplete message. The problem with the church today is they have an incomplete message. That's why I say we preach humbly the complete message of the cross. And one of the reasons when I was born again and the struggle began, I didn't know how to live for God. And we find in the book of Romans in chapter 7, and I want you to turn with me to the 24th verse, we find a cry by Paul. He says, O wretched man that I am. This is a born again believer with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That saw Jesus Christ and gave his life to him. And he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Heavenly Father, once again this morning as we enter, oh, hallelujah. Lord, this is such a special occasion that you've called me to preach this message this morning. I know there are those in this sanctuary, Lord, that know the message of the cross in regards to sanctification to a certain level, but none of us truly know the entirety of the impact, Father. And Lord, this morning again, I pray anoint your servant that I will be able to bring forth, Father, your truth with power. And Lord, I pray once again, as we take authority over you, Satan, that you will not hinder this message. And Father, I'm praying for clarity. I pray for an anointing upon every saint in this building, Father, that their spiritual ears will be open to receive what you have given to Paul and now you have given to the church. And Father, I pray once again, Lord, for your anointing. For Lord, without it, I'm an empty vessel, but with it, I am bursting full of your word. And I ask it once again, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus, amen and amen. amen. If you don't know, Satan's objective is to divert your faith as soon as you are born again. Amen. Then he wants to destroy your faith. That's what he's after. If you remember, Jesus prayed for Peter, and he told him what Satan wanted to do to him. And that sentence the Lord was telling us, every single one of you, what Satan wants to do to you. He wants to sift you as wheat. But the Lord said, I've prayed for you, Peter. Not that you'll have the wisdom of the word, not that you'll have be full of the Holy Ghost, you'll have power and preach. He said that your faith would fail not. That you'll always believe in me and what I've done on Calvary. And that Peter didn't know immediately, but he said, after you're converted, when you come to the knowledge of the truth, then you'll be able to strengthen your brothers. Because if Satan can destroy your faith, then he can destroy you. And I know what I'm talking about. When a sinner is born again, there's a supernatural event that takes place. Every person that is born in this world is born lost. That's why I always have fun with the new mommies and daddies. When they show me their newborn. And I tell them, I said, boy, that's such a beautiful little sinner you got there. And I'm telling the truth. One couple left the church because they didn't like the idea that I called their baby a sinner. But I think after a few years, they probably repented and wanted to come back and talk to me about it again. You don't have to teach a kid how to lie. You don't have to teach a kid how to steal. And there's a reason behind that. Every one of them is born lost and destined to an eternity in a lake of fire. Because number one, they are born of the seed of Adam. Everybody thinks everybody on earth is a child of God. No, they're not. They're the child of the devil. 
And you can see the fruit of what they do. Adam became imperfect because of his disobedience to God. And sin was embedded in his very being, in his soul of who he was. The sin has been transferred to all men because they are born of Adam in his likeness and in his image. And I can prove it in scripture because I know you're Bereans and you want to know. In Genesis 5, 3, it says, And Adam lived 130 years, begat a son in his own likeness and his image, and called his name Seth. Your spiritual genetics are of Adam. Understand that. When everybody is born, they have the spiritual genetics of Adam. Some people try to say, well, everybody is good. No, they're not. Everybody that's born on this earth is evil. Oh, I guarantee you. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again in John 3, 3. That is to be regenerated. That means to be regened according to the words of Jesus Christ. There's only one way to be spiritually regened, and that is the Holy Spirit is to baptize you into Christ. And that is a supernatural event that takes place and it will change who you are and what your desires are. You will no longer desire the things of the world, but you will desire the things of a thrice holy God. That in itself proves that you've been born again. And when I got born again, I instantly felt the guilt leave, the burden that I had was gone, I felt clean, I felt pure, I felt holiness and righteousness that I had never felt before. Amen. Now you will find a scripture in the book of Mark, and this is the reason I'm bringing this out because I want to clarify it. Mark 16, 16, it says, he who believes and is and is baptized shall be saved, but he who believes not shall be damned. Now, some people have used this to create a doctrine in order to be saved, you got to be water baptized. Let me clarify something it is not speaking of water baptism. If you'll notice in the second part of that, he says, those that don't believe. He didn't say those that don't believe and are not baptized. He said, those that don't believe will be damned. This is not water baptism in regards to baptismal regeneration. Because there is no such scripture that would back that up. Amen. What this is speaking of is the Holy Spirit baptizing you into Jesus Christ. God is explaining something here. He is delineating something for us to have a clear understanding. Your mental ascension that you believe in Jesus Christ will not save you. That's what he's telling you. The fact that people say, well, I believe in Jesus. Well, we know a scripture that says even the demons believe in him and they tremble at his presence. And here's what the Lord is wanting to bring out to us. If you do not exhibit true faith that is registered by the Holy Spirit, that you are lost without Christ and that you've turned from your life and you're living and you surrender yourself unto the Lord to save you, realizing that you are lost. Then the Holy Spirit will baptize you into Jesus Christ. You have been regenerated. You've been regened 
by the Holy Spirit into Christ Jesus and you're no longer of the seed of Adam, but now you are of the seed of Christ. And that's, oh, hallelujah, that's the supernatural aspect of being born again. A person that gives their life to the Lord doesn't go back out of the doors and do the same thing they did as a sinner. They're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Behold, all things are passed away and all things have become new. And everyone that's been born again knows exactly what I'm talking about. Now, after this joy and excitement of being saved, from an eternity being separated from God. Not only that, you realize that your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. Most sinners don't even know that the Lamb has a book of life, let alone who the Lamb is. They don't know diddly from doodly. They don't. They don't know barbecue sauce and hot sauce when it comes to the Word of God. But they are a brand new creation in Christ Jesus, and so many of them, as soon as they get born again, they want to become an evangelist. And they should. Because we all have the ministry of reconciliation. And what we have inside of us is not maybe a theological understanding of the Word of God. But what we do have is an experience that you can be a witness. like the guy that got healed that was crippled. You know what his testimony was? Whoop, there goes Bobby again. Whoop, there goes Bobby again, just running. That was his testimony. He didn't have to understand the power of God healed him. All he knew is, I was crippled, now I can run. And it was that man, Jesus, that did it. How he did it, I don't know, but I can run. And that's the way a new born again believer is. I don't know what has happened to me, but I feel clean. I feel righteous. I want to let other people know there's an answer to the problem of depression and alcohol and drugs. There's an answer, and his name is Jesus. My, my, my. And when they experience that, now starts the fun part. <laughs> Living the life that has been given to you. The sad fact is, after a person is born again, most churches unintentionally teaches the new Christian spiritual adultery. Which, in fact, frustrates the grace of God. And see, this is what's wrong in the churches today. It's not that maybe they don't preach the gospel in regards to salvation. They do. You're born again. Then... They walk away from what Christ did. Now we're going to live for God. No, you're not. I got a scripture for you, and it's not talking about divorce and marriage. This is found again in Romans chapter 7, and it's 1 through 4. Paul says here, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them who know the law, that how law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. It was kind of funny. My son one time told me that a guy died. And the sheriff was on his door with a warrant for his arrest. Let that sink in. I hate to tell you, buddy, but your law has no power over that man. <laughs> they just want to drag a corpse to court. <laughs> Let it sink in. For the, and this is very important. The law has dominion as long as you are living. For the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if a husband lives, she be married to another, she shall be called an adulteress. It's very important to understand that. But if her husband is dead, she is free from the law. So that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law. Listen to this. This is the revelation by the body of Christ. That you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. You see, the Holy Spirit functions in a Christian to give us 
a victorious life through the grace of God that was purchased upon Calvary. See, that's the grace of Christ. When he died on Calvary, and you'll find that in Galatians 1 and 6, because Paul questions them. He says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him who brought you into the grace of Christ. Talking about the Holy Spirit. Because it's the Holy Spirit that's going to do a work in you because of what Christ did on Calvary. Now, more to the point, the biggest problem in a Christian's life, listen to this, is sin. The biggest problem in your life is not getting a job as a Christian. It's not working around other Christians in your job. That's not your biggest problem. Your biggest problem is sin. And make no mistake, this is what you need to understand. Sin is a power. Understand that. We get redirected by the enemy and don't understand that it's a power. Now let me tell you something else about this power. It has a legal right to operate in the life of a sinner. Now here's the bad news. There's the news flash. It can even, in the life of a Christian, if one does not understand how to live for God, and most Christians don't. Sin is like a factory that produces the acts of sin. And it is the factory that needs to be shut down. Oh, amen there. But unless one understands the power of sin, the fight is always against the acts of sin. Why do you think the world has Alcoholics Anonymous? Or what's the other one, the Drugs Anonymous? Or, or I think they got rid of the Homosexuality Anonymous. They've accepted that now. And they've gotten rid of, you know, the classes that, that deal with the real problem of morality in our country. But they try to address these things as an illness. You know, you've got a sickness, you need to go see a doctor. You need to see a doctor, but his name ain't Dr. Phil. His name is Dr. Jesus. And he's the only one. And the drugs ain't your problem. The smoking ain't your problem. The drinking ain't your problem. The cussing ain't your problem. The pornography ain't your problem. The gossiping ain't your problem. The backbiting ain't your problem. The condemnation that comes out of your mouth is not the problem. The problem is the power of sin is active in your life and you're trying to deal with the acts rather than the cause. Why do you think a doctor always tries to have a proper diagnosis so they can properly treat it? They don't try to just treat the symptoms. Now, I happen to go to a doctor who's a quack. But this doctor is manageable. I had to tell the doctor what I needed. And then she wanted to make me believe it was her idea. So I said, okay, that's fine. She's the one who writes a prescription. I needed a calcium channel blocker. I was in the health field for 17 years. I understand high blood pressure and all the things that affect it. So she finally got me the drug that she believed was her idea. And I said, good job, doc. <laughs> you got to go to the root of the problem. This is one of Satan's greatest weapons against a child of God as he wants to bring in defeat, despondency, and eventually a hopelessness. All new Christians will begin to struggle with sin as they try to live for God and they begin to search for the answer to gain victory in their lives. Now, I know that each and every one of you, when you got born again, you did something you knew was wrong. And you went to God, as you should. And Lord, I'm asking you, in the name of Jesus, to forgive me. And then you lie. Yeah. What do you mean? Lord, I'll never do it again. 
not realizing you're trying to address the act rather than the cause. And the Lord loves us so much and is so long-suffering. That's why the Lord is ever interceding for us. There are things that we do we don't even know are wrong. We always think the sin is one of commission, but it's also of omission. Things the Lord has told you to do that you have not done. That is as big a sin as the one of commission. Most are confused as to why they would sin against the God that they gave their life to. They begin to look for an answer and almost everyone is told something that will continue to exacerbate their struggle with sin. You can break it down into about three basic categories that they're taught intentionally or unintentionally to deal with sin. Totally missing the real problem in the Christian's life. One of the categories is a license to sin. That is not what they say. The preacher doesn't say, now you can go in and just sin all you want and it's okay. He doesn't tell you that. But what they do is they tell you, well, you know, you're just a human, you're imperfect, and you know, God knows, and you just go to him and ask for forgiveness. And you're going to fail, and that's just the, the tragedy of being a Christian, and one day when we go to heaven, we'll never sin again. That's a lie out of hell because you're preaching defeat when Jesus Christ gave us victory. And as a matter of fact, you will find in Romans 6 that he says, and sin shall not have dominion over you. There's no residency of sin that's supposed to be in a child of God. And when they teach them that, they're giving them permission to fail. The second thing is denial. Oh, there's no real problem with sin. Just don't talk about it. If you talk about it, you'll commit it. Now, I'm going to tell you a little story that me and some other stupid teenagers did when I was much younger. We thought, we come up with this doctrine that if you don't know something, it can't hurt you. And I used to live in South Wichita. And in South Wichita, it gets real sandy. The soil is real sandy out there. And one of the things that love to grow in sandy soil is sand burrs. You know, them little prickly things. And I tell you what, if you get a good harvest of them, them spikes are about like that. And we were out there at night, and I convinced my cousins of my doctrine. Let's take our shoes off, boys. This can't hurt us. We can't see it. All right. We all lined up about four of us idiots. And we took off running. About halfway through, we were running a whole lot faster. And then when we got to the other side, we bent over and started picking all the sandbars out of our feet. Needless to say, I was no longer their leader. <laughs> Just because you try to deny that you have a problem with sin is not going to lessen the power of it in your life. And it will continue to have rule in your life. And the other is to struggle by using spiritual means. You know, Christians love to read books about how to have victory over the devil, how to have victory over this, victory over that, some how to get rich and all this other junk, how God wants to prosper you. And, you know, and it's filled with half-truths. That's what makes it such easy reading because it'll be tainted with scripture that is twisted. And you begin to read and say, well, the way you got to deal with sin is spend more time in prayer. Okay, well, how much time? You know, there was a relative of one of the big evangelists went to New York. And he didn't want to be tempted with sin. So he got up in his room, opened up the window, threw his TV out of it. Then took his key to his room and threw it out the window. Good thing he didn't throw the phone out. Because all he did was get hungry and found out that that was not the answer to being tempted by sin. Didn't help him one single bit. And again, when somebody tells me as I was going to this window, I gave my life back to the Lord. And he told me this church he wanted me to go to. And, you know... I looked like a kernel of popcorn amongst an entire black church. 
but I found some of the best friends that I will have for all eternity there. And Brother Foster, I love him. And we began to talk about the message of the cross. And that's when I began to get into it, and I began to challenge people's doctrines. And while we were sitting in the class, they give us an opportunity to ask questions. And I told him, I said, do you know how you can be born again? Poking the bear, that's what I do. I said, you don't want to sin. All of a sudden, there was a lady sitting behind me. I thought she was going to hit me with her purse. She says, well, I want you to know I'm born again and I want to sin. What I didn't say, I think you're doing some of it right now, darling. But then the gentleman that was teaching the class was very sincere. I asked him, I said, well, how do we deal with sin when we want to sin or we're overcome by some temptation? And he told me she got a fast. Boy, that opened up a can of worms. And I started poking the bear. I said, well, okay. I said, if you got a fast, do you have like a list of how long you fast for particular sins? He looked at me <laughs> like he was looking at a doorknob. <laughs> he said, well, uh, well, you, you know, I fast sometimes two days. I said, for what? I said, I don't want to know about your sin. Let's say I have a problem with pornography. How long do I have to fast? Well, and then he got frustrated because he didn't know. I said, well, what if I tell a lie? Just breakfast? <laughs> what if I want to talk about you, dinner and supper? And before it was all over, he realized what he was doing was making laws to deal with sin. What did we find out? If you are dealing and embracing the law for righteousness... You are committing spiritual adultery. When you got born again, you became the bride of Jesus Christ. He is the one that will provide all your righteousness. He is my righteousness. The law will only condemn you. You know, it's like, you know, I, 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 I went as far as I could before he finally just did everything except, why don't you just shut up? And then some say, well, you got to read the Word. Okay, well, how long do you got to read it? What do you read? Is there a chapter? Or you got to read the whole book? Or New Testament, Old Testament? What do you got to do? Deal with sin. See, it always breaks down into a law. And you can push these people in a corner where it always breaks down to a law. And the law will never liberate anybody from sin. As a matter of fact, you know where sin gets its power? Pastor Rodney knows what I'm talking about. He teaches that class. He's gentlemen over here. Sin gets its power from the law. And you will find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's where sin gets its power. So the more they teach them about laws, the more sin has a greater power in their lives. And it gets worse. You ever seen somebody, I used to be a lifeguard. Not for the reasons of saving lives. <laughs> now I'll leave that to your imagination. We, we always knew when we saw someone out there look like they were drowning and they were fighting and fighting and the more they fought, the more they went down. The more you fight against sin, the more you will go down. And eventually you will succumb to death as a Christian. And I know what I'm talking about. Oh, well, maybe you just got to listen to gospel music. Well, which one? <laughs> Is there a particular song for a particular sin? We think about it. How, how dumb that is. How Satan gets us to buy into this. This was Brad and I's great redeemer. We finally found the answer. We went to promise keepers. <laughs> we were all a bunch of hypocrites. There wasn't one there that kept a promise. <laughs> the only promise we had is we wanted to promise to get ourselves out of there. And you know, when you begin to believe that you can actually be accountable to one another to stop each of you from the sinning, you're looking to the wrong person. Oh, hey, man, boy, we got all messed up in that thing. So, well, what you need to do is take the Lord's Supper. Really? Every day? And pretty soon you make a ritual out of it. You make a law out of it. You take these things that God meant for spiritual growth 
and you've turned them into a law against sin, and it's inappropriate. It's like taking a hammer and trying to use it to put a screw into the wall. It ain't going to happen. You may get it in there, but you're going to tear the wall up. You're not going to come up with a pretty picture by the time it's over with. So what is the real problem? Now listen to this very closely. I want it to hit. Birth is something that happens to us, not something we do. You hear me? Birth is something that happens to us. When you are born again, that's something that happened to you. And I got news for you. You didn't participate in it in any way. All you did was receive it. That's it. You had nothing to offer to God. Nothing. Except a broken and a hell-bound life. And the Lord said, come unto me. Mm. And I felt the Holy Spirit move on my heart. And I turned to him at 14 years old. And I laid on my back in a church service and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And about 14 hours later, I backslid. <laughs> Let me tell you. You know, when the gospel is preached and the sinner hears the message, the Holy Spirit will confirm and authenticate its truth in the sinner. Isn't that amazing? You can tell a sinner how great heaven is. How are you going to have a glorified body? How you can zoom around at the speed of thought? That ain't going to get them saved. You can warn them about how hot the fires are in hell and how tormented you will be. It is the gospel. The Lord said he chose the foolishness of preaching to bring lost men unto him. And he says once again, if I be lifted up, I will draw men unto me. Doesn't say all men, it said men. If believed and accepted by the sinner, the Holy Spirit will bring forth the birth of a new creation in Christ Jesus. Matter of fact, in the book of Ephesians, in verse 2 and 10, it says, For we are his workmanship. You are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. I'm telling you all this to build a foundation. So stay with me. Don't go down no rabbit holes. Don't get distracted. Pay very close attention. Now, I want you to thoroughly contemplate your absolute inability to contribute in this new creation. You simply placed your faith in Christ and the fact that he died on Calvary for you. It was a gift. Matter of fact, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, and not of works, least any man should boast. Now, in my personal life as a Christian, and many of you know my testimony, I experienced the treadmill of sin, repent. Sin, repent. You know, the view rarely changes when you're constantly defeated by sin. You get on that treadmill. Sin, repent, sin, repent, sin, repent, sin, repent. That is not the life that the Lord gave us through his work on Calvary. Soon I lost my way because the enemy convinced me that God no longer loved me because of my continuing failures. There was no more use in trying. Perhaps I was not meant to be a Christian. And I'll deal with this later on. After this, I came back to the Lord, then failed once again. I'm trying to live for the Lord and then back into the world again. Once again, I came back to the Lord and trying to find new ways to live for God without being dominated by sin. All of this took place from the time I was 14 years old to the time I was 56. I gave my life again back to the Lord on April the 12th of 2004 in my bathroom. Every demon of hell. The Lord, like he put his hands around her throat and said, you stand right over here for a moment because I'm going to talk to my son. And I'm going to tell you when I felt God's presence. I said, Lord, if you'll take me back. Had no question. He embraced his arms around me. He said, I gave my life for you. I love you. And I will never give up on you. 
You see, when a Christian fails, it doesn't mean they have fallen. It means that they need to understand what it is that Christ did in His life for us. And when I gave my life back to the Lord, I began to plead with God. I said, show me how to live for you without this miserable existence of always being overcome by sin. What do I have to do, Lord? One night in studying, the Lord showed me a scripture. And it's the one that Pastor Rodney quoted. And it validated it. Became, it let me know. I said, yeah, I'm on the right track. He said, knowing this... That our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth you should not serve sin. While I was sitting there in the middle of the night reading this, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit tapped me on the shoulder. And was such a gentle voice. Said, you have to believe that. You have to believe it. Hmm. I didn't know exactly what it meant, but I do know that I latched onto that with all of my strength, for I knew that all of my hope lied in that scripture to know what it meant. I knew this was something I needed to know. He says this, knowing this, I didn't know anything, and I didn't even know what this was. But I knew when the Holy Spirit told me to believe in it, you can't believe in something you don't understand. Well, I take the word, and I... No, you don't. You know, you begin to understand the word because... The Word of God will be revealed by the Holy Spirit, what He's talking about, and then He will validate it with other parts of the Word of God. You just don't take Scripture and go, well, I get it. No, you don't. The Word of God is as deep as it is high as it is wide. It is like it's pregnant and continues to give birth to revelation in your heart. I needed to know. There was something about the old man I needed to know. And I began to understand that there was a body of sin, not an act of sin. That's the first thing that the Lord gave me in this scripture. That the body of sin might be destroyed. It hit me. I said, man, this is powerful. In order that I would not be a servant or a slave to sin. And I thought, okay. And as I continued my studies of other scriptures that correlated with what Paul had instructed in this scripture, I soon began to understand the terminology. You've got to understand the terminology in this scripture. If you don't, you ain't going to know what to believe. You know, sometimes I just say, Lord, I want to believe, but I don't know what it is I'm supposed to believe. And you know what? God will react to honesty, but not pretentiousness. You see, when we study the Word of God, we have to go beyond the cursory or surface and dig into the Word of God with a tenacious appetite for the comprehension and truth. You see, if you don't have comprehension, it ain't going to help you. One time... You know, see, I, I didn't finish the 10th grade. And some of you are going, well, I can tell. You be quiet. But I joined the Army. And I stayed in there for a while. Almost went to Vietnam. And the captain of our company says, what are you doing in here? you got two kids. So he made me permanent party, thank God. And I didn't have to go to Vietnam. But when I got out, I found out that I was credited with some of the GI benefits. So then... I was able to go back, get a tutor, and I finished up my, G, my GED, and uh, it was a great tutor. I scored so high on it, I didn't have to take an ACT test to get into college. And of course, I wanted to go into college. I was thirsty for education and knowledge. So when I got back into college, I realized that I was way behind everybody else because I had no 10th, 11th, 12th grade English. 
And I hated that when I got in there. I didn't know a verb from a mad verb, from a noun, from a pronoun. But I learned because I wanted to understand. But I wanted to learn math and I wanted to be a doctor. So I wanted to take pre-med and I took, I loved chemistry. I scored an ace in organic chemistry during the summer as I worked hard at it. And, but I went into the math class and I was going to take trigonometry. And when I walked into the class, I already signed up for it, paid the tuition, all this stuff. And when I walked in there, the instructor wrote on there the quadratic formula. For those of you that don't know trigonometry, it is not for fourth graders. He wrote that up. There's three unknowns, X, Y, and Z. And he, he wrote this quadratic formula up there because that was the whole basis, a foundation for the uh, class of trigonometry. And when he wrote that up there, and he made the statement, if you don't know what this is, you don't belong in this class. About three of them walked out. Not me. I stood my ground. And then I went and canceled the class. <laughs> I didn't know what that was. And so my point is, You've got to have comprehension of the basics of the Word of God or you're going to miss what you need to know. It's about knowing. That's why he says, know you not that as many of us that were baptized into Christ was baptized into his death. If you just read it and don't have comprehension, it means nothing to you. Satan goes, well, there's another flake. Because your faith is going to be challenged and the Lord is going to allow it to be challenged. You know why? Because he wants to validate it in your being. That you'll know, that you know, that you know. He gave me victory on Calvary and there ain't nothing going to change my mind. Too late, you slime ball. I'm not talking about the politicians, I'm talking about the devil. You see, you can't know something unless you understand what it's talking about. First thing I needed to understand, what was the old man? You know, I told my wife, I was talking to her, I said, boy, you don't, you don't ever call the cops and say, well, the old man's dead. <laughs> but see, that's what the Lord's telling us. The old man's got to die. Now listen to this. This is so important. It's easy, but it's not so easy if you don't understand it. I soon discovered that the old man was the person, listen to this, this is so important, that depended upon self-effort to live for God. That's the old man. You know, you're taught as a child growing up, if you're going to do it, you got to get out there and do it. If I don't do it, it ain't going to get done, blah, 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 blah. You got to be independent. You got to get out here and fight for what you want in this world, blah, 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 that's what you do. And now when you come to the Lord, it's the reverse opposite. I preached a message one time, out of control. Everybody thought I'd lost my mind. No. You've got to be out of control. You've got to get out from behind the steering wheel of your spiritual life and let the Lord do the driving. He knows, number one, how to drive, and he knows where he's going. That's like my wife. When she ever says, oh, you're lost, you need to get a map. You know what my reply always is? We're making good time. It's not a matter of where we're going, it's how fast we're going. <laughs> yeah, all you men know exactly what I'm talking about. Now they got GPS and there's some woman telling us how to get there. <laughs> That's all right. It's all right. <laughs> And I found out when my self-effort was trying to live for Christ in my own ability, in my own power. The Holy Spirit will not honor that. He's not going to endorse your fleshly attempts to live for God. It would deny Christ what he did on Calvary. It ain't happening. Now listen to this. Now realizing that my desire to serve God was impotent, to overcome the power of sin. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, I'm glad you asked. I want you to look here in the 18th verse of Romans 7. You can just listen to me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. 
That ain't me, sin. That's God. So when I come up to you and I say, hey, and your flesh dwells no good thing. Spiritually speaking. Okay? For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. Because he's looking inside. It's not there. It doesn't exist. He says, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. How many can relate to that? From 14 to 56, I tried to live for God and do good. And every time I tried to do good, evil was there. And the evil I didn't want to do was the evil I did. I found myself looking at porn again. I found myself out drinking. I found myself out doing the things I didn't want to do. Next thing you know, every time I backslid, it got worse. Because I found a new vice. Whether it was cocaine or meth or where there was a joint, whatever it was. You always get worse when you go back out into the world. But you know what? The power of God is still the same. Amen, amen. amen. Now listen to what he says. Now if I do that I would not, in other words, I don't want to do it, it ain't my will, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in, oh listen to this, in me. You see, the sin nature in a Christian can still be active. The power of sin can still control a child of God. And there's the scripture to prove it. Paul was baptized with the Holy Ghost, saved on the road to Damascus, had the greatest conversion of any person on earth because it was done by personally by Jesus Christ. But yet, he couldn't live for God. And the Lord allowed him to go through this. When the Lord allows you to go through things, it's not for your harm. It's for you to learn something. And if you don't learn something in your relationship with God, you will continue to fail in that area over and over and over. And God will allow you to do this to finally wake you up. Listen. Sometimes I've heard God. It must have been his knuckles going knock, 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 knock. Listen to this. Just listen to this. I find in a law that when I would do good, when I, I, the old man, evil is present with me. Why is that? It's called self-righteousness. It's trying to improve your state with God and you can't do it. It is impossible when you finally resign to that fact, now God's got something to work with. Now listen. Mm. The next thing I began to understand was that the old man had to die. The old man had to die. Had to die. But it had to die in a particular way. It had to be crucified with Christ. For the old man could not die by self-effort. If you think about it, this will give you a pictorial. Try to nail yourself to a cross. You got one arm dangling. Can't do it. You can't crucify self. It has to be crucified with Christ. Oh, I began to see this and I went, well, this is starting to, make a lot of sense here. Now listen. That you cannot again crucify yourself. It has to die accordingly to being crucified with Christ. I began to understand that when I was born again, the old man was crucified with Christ. That's what he told me. But what happened with the crucifixion of that old man? Why was he still alive? I couldn't understand it. And I'll tell you about that in just a moment. The next thing I began to study and I realized was that the old man and the body of sin are intertwined. You can't separate them. If the old man was still alive, then the body of sin would be active. And not only active, but I would become a slave to it. But what is the body of sin? Oh, well, let's see here. 
Romans 6, 1 and 3. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we, listen, who are dead to sin, live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ was baptized into his death? Now this first began to make sense to me. It was a revelation that when I was born again, the old man was crucified with Christ. You see, when you got born again, the Lord wasn't going to abandon you to not have power to overcome sin. He was not going to leave you part done. That's why the old man had to be crucified. You see, we still live in this fleshly body. And we're going to be there until the rapture takes place or you go by the way of the grave. And then you're going to receive a glorified body where there is no old man in there. You see, your old man is the flesh, that self-effort, the ability to do it yourself, the old I can get her done attitude. But I, you know what I'm saying? Okay. But what happened in my relationship with the Lord that sin still dominates me? I was, I was, you know, this is a process I went through over a year. And I began to listen to Brother Jimmy Swaggart. And I began to understand the message of the cross in a greater clarity. So when the Lord reminded me of Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 4, he says, if you're married to me, you cannot depend upon the law. And I was trying to fight sin, the acts of sin. I'm not going to do this anymore. Then I found myself doing it because I was trying to do it in self-effort. Now listen to this. I was alive in Christ because I was dead to the law. So what happened? Why did sin start dominating me? The answer was found in Romans 7 and 9. And when I read this, I went, I had one of those aha moments. The revelation. Now listen to this. Paul says, for I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Now I had a comprehensive understanding of what happened in my attempt to live for God in the past. It became very plain. The body of sin is the sin nature that Adam took on when he trespassed against God. One of the reasons it's called the body of sin, it produces a plethora of acts. Think about it. You got a body. My fingers can do what my toes can't do. But my toes can do what my hands can't do. You know, my eyes can do what my ears can't do, and I could go on and on and on. The body of sin brings forth a plethora of different acts of sin. Some people say, well, I was born homosexual. No, you wouldn't. We're all born exactly equal, because the book of Psalm tells us that. Everybody is born exactly the same. But the thing is, you have a proclivity for a certain thing in your flesh that you like. Where there's homosexuality, where there's being a lesbian, or where there's being a pedophile, or, or where there's being a drug addict, where there's being an alcoholic, where there's being... I had this one guy talk to me, and I believed him. And I was trying to do some financial business with him. He tried to convince me he had all this money. He told me he was a pilot in the Navy, and he'd shot down all these enemy planes, and he would flew this plane and that. Man, I'm just bonking. Wow, man, you're really cool. And I find out that guy nothing but a bold-faced liar. Never even been around a plane, let alone fly one of them. And he was an habitual liar. That's what he lived for. He just told these tall tales. That's what he did. So it doesn't matter what kind of sin. We're all born in the likeness and the image of Adam. And it doesn't matter. There's a plethora of sins. That's why it's called the body of sin. So again, I began to understand more and more about exactly what was going on. And not only that, but God had established a law, listen, before the creation of the universe. And the law was called the law of sin and death. Well, I'm giving you a whole bucket load today. And I know the people on Facebook are watching. And I hope 
But they write down and go back and study this for themselves. And they're going to find out, I'm telling you the truth. The sin nature is passed to the human race through Adam. This is the main reason that Jesus is called the last Adam. And he did not come out of the loins of Adam. But it was God that prepared a body for Christ. And you can find that in Hebrews 10 and 5. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 9, the apostle attempted to live for Christ by attempting to obey the law as a means of righteousness. Anytime you're dealing with sin by your own ability, you're trying to be righteous in what you can do. And it's impossible. Matter of fact, the Lord says, your righteousness are as filthy rags. And he didn't say righteousness, he said righteousnesses. Your efforts to be righteous before God. If you think you can do something that God will look at and say, oh, that's the little poster child of righteousness. I'm sorry, but that position's already been taken. He died on a cross and he is sitting on the right hand side of the Father. Amen. This is our righteousness. He is my, and boy, I tell you what, when you understand that, that revelation, Jesus Christ is my righteousness. You know what? You ain't going to get no more righteous than that. They ain't going to get no more righteousness than that. And when Satan comes to try to condemn you, that's what I always do when he comes. I go, really? Is that all you got? Huh. He tried to use the law as a means of righteousness. He then declared that the sin nature revived and he died. What does it mean he died? I'm glad you asked. Listen to this. You go back to Romans 6, 1 and 2. And he says, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? In the Greek, that word, God forbid, it's like, God forbid! It was shouted. God didn't save you to be dominated and to live under the yoke of sin. And he made this statement, How shall we who are dead to sin live? Live any longer therein. If you are being held captive in sin, you are not alive in the way that Jesus Christ wants you to be alive, but you're dead to the power of the Holy Spirit because God's grace has been frustrated because you're looking to the wrong object. And that was a new word I learned when I came into the revelation of the cross in regards to sanctification. So once again, I understood now, when you're born again, it was afforded by the work of Christ and what he did on Calvary. Colossians, Colossians 2 and 10 through 14, listen to this. And you are complete in him. Hmm. You see, when the Lord made you, he made you complete. He's still doing a work on the inside, but you are complete which is the head of all principality and power. And who also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism. See, when you get water baptized, is symbolic of going down into the grave. You're dead to self. You raise back up. Now you're alive unto God wherein you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins and the circumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him. That means made alive. Having forgive you of all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. You can't obey the law in self-effort. It is impossible, and you will frustrate the grace of God. And took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Here we can see that Christ has dealt with the law on the cross, that we are no longer under the law, nor do we try to obey it. Some people say, well, you got to obey the law. Well, I got news for you. You're going to be completely destroyed. You're going to be completely fruitless in that effort. And again, I listen to this very closely. Here we can see 
that Christ has dealt with the law on the cross and that we no longer under the law, nor do we try to obey it, but we are complete in Christ. Now, if you don't believe me, James 2.10 says this, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. That'll take you out of the game. <laughs> you, you're guilty of all of them. What the Lord is telling us here, if you're going to try to live by the law, you're doomed. Therefore, it is the Holy Spirit that will do the work as he has been commissioned by the finished work of Jesus Christ and through that alone. So you might want to give great attention to what your faith is in. That's the object of your faith. And I'm about to close here. All right, perfect timing. Now listen to this. Paul writes in the book of Galatians, and if you read the Pauline letters, you will find a wealth of information about the doctrine of the church, the true doctrine. He says, oh foolish Galatians. Now, I've gotten in trouble because from the pulpit I've called people morons and stupid. I'm just like an umpire behind the plate. I call them as I see them. I'm not calling any child of God a moron. I'm calling those that fight against God are morons. Those that are stupid, it's because they are not wise. I do my best. I don't cuss up here. You ought to give me some credit. And I don't cuss at home. I don't cuss anyplace else. Now, occasionally when I'm watching, all right, I'll leave that alone. <laughs> Now listen, listen to this, yeah. Sometimes I got to shut it off. My wife goes, they can't hear you, honey. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Paul says, oh foolish, means stupid in the Greek. Galatians, who has bewitched you? In other words, who's manipulated you into believing a lie? That you should, should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set oh, forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish or stupid? I, hey, this is God's words. Don't look at me. Having begun in the spirit, are you made perfect by the flesh? That perfection means to a level of righteousness. You see, your righteousness is imputed. You didn't earn it. When you got born again and you became a new creation in Christ, God says, perfect. Do you know, when, one of the things that coin collectors do, they always look for imperfections. Because the imperfections are worth a lot of money. They've been stamped wrong or whatever. But every time God produces a born-again new creation, perfect, 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 perfect. No, he's flawed. No, he's not. Perfect. We have flaws, but not in his righteousness. We are absolutely perfect. And you will never be made perfect by your own self-effort. The Bible refers to your Christian lives as a walk. And this is where I'm coming down to the gotcha, hope you get it. This only, again here, the Bible refers to Christians' lives as a walk. And this is also known as a sanctifying process, which means to form Christ in you. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing, is to form Christ. If you don't stop him, you can stop him. You can frustrate the grace of God. Now listen to this. In Colossians 2, 6 through 7 says this. And I'm about to close. As you have therefore received Christ. In other words, how did you receive Christ as your Savior? How were you brought into the kingdom of God? How was you birthed? Strictly by faith. And Christ and what he did on Calvary. The gospel was preached. His blood was shed. That your sins could be taken away. And that you could be made a new creation of Christ Jesus. Of course, you didn't understand all that. All you knew was you was a miserable state of being. 
And Lord, I need some relief. I need some relief, Father. I can't live like this anymore. And you surrender to him. That's how you receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says, so walk ye in him. In other words, how you receive the Lord as your savior is how you live this sanctified life. Nothing's changed. You still keep your faith in Christ and what he did on Calvary. It never changes. If it does, and you place your faith in some other object, you will frustrate the grace of God. He will not help you in your self-effort. You're doomed. But if you realize that you've been crucified with Christ, I got one last scripture I'm going to tell you in just a minute. He says here, rooted. Now listen, when he tells you this, as you therefore receive Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Rooted. Don't let anybody ever change what you believe. And built up in him and established in the faith. The faith means Christ and him crucified. As you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. I tell you, I was studying even this morning some more. And I got up early this morning. And last night I was in my office. And... I was just sitting there, my two little schnauzers at my side, and the Holy Ghost filling the room. I just lifted up my hands. I began to say, thank you, Lord, that you've taught me how to live for you. It's all you, none of me. All you, none of me. And it's like the Lord just embraced me and said, you finally got it, didn't you? <laughs> I said, but it didn't take 56 years. <laughs> That's all. When I come into this revelation, that's when the Lord set my feet on a path to be a pastor and teach people how to live for him. And I'm going to tell you, this is the most important, most powerful thing that you will ever have a revelation of in your life to live for God. If you don't place your faith in Christ and what he did on cross for this life, you will be miserable. And you may lose your way and you may lose your soul. And that's the reason that is so important. Now listen to this. I'm going to tell you this in closing. Sin is a power of such magnitude. It took the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary to overcome that power. That's how much power is in sin. Colossians 2.15 says, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Now listen, and by this a law that God made before the universe was manifested by Christ on Calvary. This is the most powerful law in the universe, what I'm getting ready to read you. It says, for the law, it's a law, people, of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. 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 He made it so simple. It's just simply place your faith in what he did on Calvary. When I came into this revelation, and I'm closing, it's simply the object of your faith. What are you depending on? Are you depending on some wacko book that some donut made? <laughs> now I watch mine on DVD. <laughs> if they ain't preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified, turn your back on them. Paul said not to be entertained by the foolishness that will destroy your faith. Satan knows what he's doing and he knows how to get in the crack. And the Lord said, don't give place to Satan. Don't give place to him. No matter how miserable your Christian existence is, don't you ever quit believing that Christ won victory for us in this life to live it on Calvary. Never quit. You may fail, but you'll never fall. Never, 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 because God's word is true. He said, I hold it above my own name to bring it forth and to perform it. I will do it. Stand to your feet this morning. 
no longer is it born again, let the struggle begin. It's born again, enjoy the victory. Amen. amen and amen. I pray that you have taken this to heart. And it wouldn't hurt if you got the CD and listened to it again. What I told you today is just a shortened version of the things that you need to grow in. Because Satan will challenge your faith and what I preached this morning. But I will guarantee you what I preached this morning is the absolute unadulterated truth. And not only it is, but you can see it in my life. You can see it in my life that God has ordained me to do this. This is why I live, is to teach people how to live for God. Father, I thank you once again. You're an awesome God. You're a patient and long-suffering God. And Lord, your love for us is eternal. And Father, I thank you for the life that was given, Lord, O Calvary. My Lord, the price that was paid for us. You brought a worth to our eternal souls. And Father, I know throughout eternity we will glorify the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, once again this morning, I pray that you would shower your blessings of this great revelation on the hearts of each and every one that they may grow in your grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. I pray you bring them back at the appointed time. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Love one another. Amen.